This is Dylan FM, the podcast that goes deep into the work and world of Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place with your host, Craig Danuloff. What I like best about reading Song and Dance Man Volume 1 and talking to Michael Gray about it on a chapter-by-chapter basis on this podcast was the context it provided about Bob Dylan as a songwriter. Everyone knows that Dylan had a relationship with folk, rock, literature, and the blues. But over the course of that book, we learned how deep and intricate and impactful that relationship was. While never focusing on the man as a biographer would, Michael Gray provided us with a biography of Dylan's mind, how he voraciously ingested folk music, and how it shaped his songwriting. How he went through his formative teenage years at exactly the right time to be washed over by Little Richard and Fats Domino and Elvis Presley, and how the best of their innovations were fused into his DNA. How he sat in B.J. Rolfson's literature class at Hibbing High, and obviously paid close attention and learned modes of thinking and expressions that he would call on just a few years later. And how the blues records that some of his Hibbing and St. Paul friends had initiated a seemingly encyclopedic awareness of the musical and lyrical inspirations that is fueling him still to this day. Volume 1 of Song and Dance Man destroyed the idea of Bob Dylan as a prodigy who graduated from Hibbing High in 1959 with all of the tools he needed to fulfill the sense of destiny that he spoke of in the 60 Minutes interview. Instead, it showed us exactly how Dylan did something that he would advise others to do in the interview shown in the Rolling Thunder movie. He created himself. He studied and borrowed from scores of the best artists and thinkers that had come before him, applying his genuine gifts and talents to help him create things that were truly new, but which had precedence Nevertheless, this doesn't diminish what Dylan did, but it does help explain it. It's fun to think that Dylan just spits out lines like those that made him famous, but it's far more interesting, in many ways impressive, to know at least a little about why he spit them out. Song and Dance Man Volume 1 gives us the background to do that. It was almost a decade between the first and second editions of Song and Dance Man, and Volume 2 of the new 50th anniversary series is largely taken from that late 80s update. Today we're talking to Michael Gray about Chapter 1 in Volume 2. The volume is called Yonder Come Sin, and the chapter is called The Coming of Slow Train. But it starts with Street Legal, and for me at least, it casts that album in a whole new light. You'll hear Gray again help us to see the big picture, how Dylan's own views and goals came through in the totality of his songwriting over the years, and how street legal should have, or at least could have, made the eventual emergence of the gospel bob a lot less shocking. We talk about that evolution in this episode, and we'll continue in future episodes walking through chapters of Volume 2, which you can get now at Amazon in paperback or on Kindle. There's a link in the show notes. If you're hearing this, you're listening to our public feed. There's an extended version of this episode. They're usually at least twice as long, available for FM Plus and premium subscribers. You can subscribe right now in Apple Podcasts or at fmpods.com. You'll get the extended versions and bonus episodes of not only this show, but all the shows in the FM Podcast Network, which includes Bob Dylan, The Dylan Taunts, and more. We have no ads in these episodes, and our subscribers and members make this show possible. If you can join us, you'll get a lot, and your support will be appreciated. Now, here's our talk about Song and Dance Man, The Art of Bob Dylan, Volume 2, which is called Yonder Come Sin. And today we're looking at Chapter 1, The Road to Slow Train. All right, Michael. Hello. Welcome back. Hi, Craig. We make it to Volume 2. Indeed. We've established his vast and deep influences, what he did with them and how. You know, the tone of the book shifts a little bit because you start looking at specific work. It was littered throughout the first 
part, but you never stopped and said, okay, this is blonde on blonde. Let's talk about it. But for the next two volumes, we're kind of specific on albums and songs. Um, yeah, well, that's that's because the, uh, the work this time was uh, catching up on the 80s and volume three catching up on the 90s. Whereas volume one, that's uh, that's most of it, not the pre-war blues chapter, but most of it is from when it was all happening at the time. And so, you know, the themes worked well. Whereas here, I think the albums, you have to more or less take the albums one by one. And I think that's what we do. Starting here with uh, Street Legal, because what I'm saying in the book is that Street Legal is it's a terrific album in itself, but it's also very much laying the groundwork for saying, look, I'm, uh, I'm heading for Jesus here, particularly in some of the songs. And, and then, of course, what we get after that is Jesus. We get Slow Train Coming and Saved and some outtakes, one of which is Yonder Come Sin, which is the title of this volume. In retrospect, even treating the first part as the um, you know the the basics of Bob Dylan to some degree, the the infrastructure of him relative to his use of all those other forms of music, it really yeah. does put a put a base of understanding under him for those of us coming now. That I I think it it feels like the best way to do the book, even if you did it you know after the fact. But before we jump into Street Legal, I, the, the the very start of Volume Two points out this transition that you just talked about, but in, again, in kind of much more overall tones, right? You start by talking about Bob Dylan's sort of history of, of morality or taking a principled stance to the things that you do in life. And then you yeah. walk us through a series of steps before, you know, frankly, the, the, the clarity and, and convincing case you make essentially for street legal being the beginning of the gospel years is, is phenomenal. We'll get to that. I want to go through that transition first. It starts out, you, you point out a bunch of morality, you know, or moral clauses in songs from the sixties. Yeah. From, from masters of war to, to more subtle ones. And you talk about the shift from to some degree, external to internal, you know, back to external, which is, I think is the thing that happens through Dylan quite a lot. How much of that transition in his viewpoint were you able to see in retrospect, or was it evident at the time? Uh, at the time, when I first encountered him, it was 1964. So, so he was, um, the newest album was another side of, the fourth album, which some people were uh, complaining about because it wasn't so strictly a protest album as the previous two had been. And so, uh, you know, my first introduction to him really was as a person who had plenty to protest about. That is to say, uh, someone who cared about uh, the state of the world. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the basis of it, you know. I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of popular uh, singer-songwriters just just write about their love life or uh, their theoretical love life or, you know, how much they like drinking beer or whatever it might be. But uh, Dylan has never been in that sort of uh, camp. And uh, even, you know, when I came to hear the earlier work, it was just riddled with struggles with morality of one kind or another. I mean, he was a serious young man, you know, and... Uh, and of course, he he sort of relishes all that, even in the stuff he hadn't written himself. Earlier things that he recorded, like uh, "What You're Going to Do When the Devil Comes Creeping in Your Room," you know, that's not um, that's not Elton John, is it? You make the point, and this happens over just a few pages as you set the stage in this in this volume, that he essentially starts maybe suggesting outwards to people that it's not so much um, an externally applied moral code, but that you need to look at yourself and you need to take responsibility. Here, here's yes. our, first, uh, our first selection from, from this volume. It was not, however, a sudden change from the hip amoralist to the priest. Dylan had seized on a new code, but remained utterly consistent in his preoccupation with struggling for a code. 
Along with this unfailing sense of the need for moral clarity, Dylan's work also Dylan's work has also been consistently characterized by a yearning for salvation. In fact, the quest for salvation might be called the central theme of Bob Dylan's entire output. And then you you point out a bunch of songs with cases where you evidence this, Memphis Blues Again, Senor, I Shall Be Released, and Dirge. And you specifically talk about how a quest for salvation permeates John Wesley Harding and Blood on the Tracks. And and it does, doesn't it? Uh, you never get away from that for long in Bob Dylan. I mean, um, uh, and sometimes it's a song, you're, you're listening to a song in which he's perhaps agonizing about this. An early-ish one would be uh, My Back Pages, you know, where he's basically wringing his hands and saying, I shouldn't have been taking on these sort of traditional, conventional sets of assumptions. I, I should have been working it out for myself. And that really is the theme then that we get all through the 1960s and on. I shall be released, yes. You know, the, the quest for salvation is still there, very much so. But what, how to find that salvation is a, is a problem that he wrestles with, I think. And um, he wrestles with it over a, over a long period of his work. And um, he doesn't really come to thinking he's uh, found it until until he renounces all that individual code finding and submits himself to uh, the code of the born again people. It is interesting how the the public narrative, which is that the gospel years are this little sliver, yeah, contrasts with the reality, as you said, the Bible's you know, throughout his entire career. And and you now make a case more convincingly for the first part of his career. It's pretty evident to anyone who listens that it's never left after. And mm-hmm. so we we really now can see the the whole arc from the covers and and the first album. And and now he didn't even leave that far as some of us might have thought in the, the si- late 60s at least in the 70s. Uh, it, it becomes much more fluid as opposed to this short aberration. Yes. Yeah, I think it's career long. And so is his extraordinary knowledge of biblical text. And I mean, this is so clear in this volume two, in this Yonder Comes Sin uh, material, uh, all through. I mean, not just, again, not just the the so-called Born Again albums, but all the way through the 80s. Uh, you know, we're looking particularly at great songs like Groom Still Waiting at the Altar and Joker Man and, of course, Blind Willie McTell and so on. And um, in all these, the use of biblical text is vast. Just glance along through some of the footnotes uh, in these chapters. And, uh, I mean, very seldom does he just quote straightforwardly a verse of biblical text, but very, very often he twists one or or builds a, a poetic line because he knows one. And um, you know, this is this is not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, this is or, or, or Genesis. Uh, it's everything. I mean, there are quotes here and and uses that he has built upon here from. Oh, many, many books of the Bible. I mean, not just Leviticus and Deuteronomy either, but Daniel, uh, uh, Lamentations, Job, uh, uh, Ezekiel, Revelation, Old and New Testament. Uh, uh, his knowledge of this material is phenomenal, and uh, it, it was a very rewarding, though difficult, task for me when, in order to tackle this work of his properly, I had to actually, from cover to cover, read the King James Bible. And it is almost always the King James Bible that he uses. It's, it's, it's the poetic version in the English language. It's the version 
that is saturated in the work of Shakespeare as well as Bob Dylan. It, it reminds me of the way you talked about his use of the blues, which was also not simple quoting from the you know, most known, but yeah. reinterpretation, subtle shifting around and application of principles from obscure corners. Yes. It's one of those things about him that's, you know, it's impossible to diagram, but you kind of wish someone could explain, you know, how, how do you get, how do you take 15% of this obscure thing and find a brand new way to put it in? Mm. It, it is, it's remarkable, but it, unfortunately there's not, you, at least I wish there was some other way to explain it, but it's, especially at the volume, this is what comes in with kind of the stuff Scott Warmoth does. You could imagine one of them and go, oh, that was clever. He remembered that movie line. He put it here. And then you see the one sentence with three movies, but jumbled and yes. the, the sophistication of it, which is, I mean, yes. that's maybe the third version of it, right? So we have the blues, the Bible, and and other authors who have all been assimilated, regurgitated, reapplied throughout yeah. this career. And of, course, and of course, all the anonymous authors of uh, folk song. Right. As for Dylan's extraordinary knowledge of the Bible, I, uh, it, uh, I'm just amazed by it over and over again. I mean, I've been, you know, I've been proofreading for this uh, for this volume, and now looking at the finished text again, and uh, it just staggers me over and over how much of this material. He knows in, inwardly enough to use it so creatively and so resourcefully. He's not, uh, you know, he never skims the surface of it. He really knows it and he takes it seriously. Um, he hasn't always taken it seriously as, as religious truth. I mean, that, that probably was quite a brief period, but he, he took it seriously as literature his whole life. It seems to me. So as we look at this this shift, though, from 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 morality to salvation, um, you have an interesting quote I'm going to read, which comes back in a in a second rejoinder a little bit later. From blood on the tracks onward, Dylan shifts away from women as savior, and to trace this process is to hear his slow train in the distance, to find his quest for salvation refocusing itself into a quest for Christ. Well, you know, uh, I mean, that just, that summarizes what I think is the situation. Um, in terms of, uh, if we're coming on to street legal and the way that that moves us from Sarah to Jesus, if you like, uh, I, I have to say I've always felt uneasy about, about uh, applying such biographical Such a so I've been I've always been uneasy about applying such a, a a biographical focus onto this material, because it's never been my purpose to write his biography, and the work ought to stand alone. But you know, as soon as you have someone whose personality and charisma and and famousness is as great as Bob Dylan's, then um, then it's impossible, really. To just take the work as if this is by someone you know nothing about. I mean, that's just not possible for us. Um, it's the advantage we have in Shakespeare because we do so we do know so little about him, uh, and the work you know the work stands alone. But in the in the case of Street Legal, it just seemed to me inevitable that he was that he was. Um, that he was going through this process. And in, in my own defense of, sort of bringing this biographical stuff into it, I would, I would just say that I uh, certainly never mentioned Sarah in print until after he had recorded and released a song called Sarah on Desire. Uh, you know, I mean, and he put her into... Uh, Ronaldo and Clara, 
uh, you know, he did not keep her private at that point in, in, in his career. And so you make the point, again, in, in Dylan's evolution and what he's sharing with us through, through his work, an increased preoccupation with the idea of betrayal. And then you say the following about this, this shift and, and point out another element of it. This strand begins to appear on planet waves. I ain't hauling any of my lambs to the marketplace anymore. And it produces in Dylan's work something that at first comes across as an astonishing leap of arrogance. That is, that Dylan quite clearly starts to identify with Christ. He begins to do this not in the conventional taught sense, that Jesus is my friend sent by God to be a human just like me, but in the sense of confusing himself with Christ. From Blood on the Tracks onward, we are given parallel after parallel between Dylan and Christ, both charismatic leaders, both message bringers to their people, both martyrs become of, because both get betrayed. In retrospect, it is as if Dylan eventually converts to Christianity because of the way he has identified with Christ and understood his struggles through his own. That's quite a leap, really. But, you know, it's very clear on Blood on the Tracks, you know. In a little hilltop village, they gambled for my clothes. I bargained for salvation. They gave me a lethal dose. I mean, who else is he identifying with? Took my crown of thorns. Yeah. Yeah. I have always loved street legal. I can't understand how anybody ever didn't, frankly. Um, You know, it seems like incredible Dylan nitpicking, you know, even if the production's not you know, as separated as you might like, the uh-huh. sound, the vibrancy of language, everything else that's going on there is just so interesting, even frankly, if you don't understand it. But as you start to apply and go through it the way you do in in here in volume two, it is Dylan's personal experience and observations that are coming through quite clearly. So I'm saying you can enjoy it without it, but you can find so much in there if you do know this stuff, and especially as as you you know, as you pointed out. I I would say that uh, at the time when it was new, there were things that people could uh, demur from about it. I mean, I remember Greil Marcus saying that Dylan's voice sounded dead on this album, which I didn't agree with, but it was a point of view. And um, I remember, you know, when I, when I met Dylan backstage at Earl's Court in 78, when he was doing those, marvelous shows and the album was brand new one of the things that really surprised me that he said not to me to robert shelton but in my presence was uh, the old songs really do stand up don't they and i found myself thinking it's not the old songs you want to worry about bob it's the new songs and you know what i was thinking of were things like baby stop crying i mean you know, this is this is not songwriting on a on a par with a hard rain's gonna fall or or tears of rage. But of course, um you know, I remember the very first time I heard Blonde on Blonde, I sort of fretted a bit in case it was a bit closer to pop music than I thought of Bob Dylan as as having to be. So so street legal, yes. I mean, uh, and yes, people bitched about the production. What can you say? It's uh, it's an album that's just full of warmth and life and and vibrancy. Yeah, and some of the tracks, some of the tracks mean more to me than others, and not necessarily, particularly the ones that I single out as the most significant major songs in the book. I'm I'm surprised now, in retrospect, I suppose, to find that I one of the ones I signal out for as particularly great was um, "No Time to Think," which which uh, few people think of as one of his great songs. But among the ones I really like a lot are uh, "We Better Talk This Over" and "True Love Tends to Forget." You know, they're both marvelous nuggets of material and and not on the original list you wrote in the book let me this is a a bit of a longer passage but it's i think it's just a phenomenal 
set up for street legal, especially maybe a recast of the way you know most people think about it. The truly central album is Street Legal, on which every song deal with, deals with love's betrayal, deals with Dylan's being betrayed like Christ, and deals head-on with Dylan's need to abandon woman's love. Street Legal is one of Dylan's most important, cohesive, and complex albums, and it warns us, as pointedly as art ever should, of what is to come. It prepares us for Dylan's conversion to Christianity just as plainly as the end of John Wesley Harding prepares us for the country music of Nashville Skyline, and just as plainly as bringing it all back home signals what is just around the corner on Highway 61 revisited. Street Legal brings it all together. Dylan the consistent moralist. Dylan the writer who draws heavily on the Bible. Dylan caught in the struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Dylan ending his relationship with Sarah. Dylan the betrayed victim. Both of well, that's all we have time for in the public feed. If you'd like to hear the rest of this conversation, plus the uh, extended versions of every chapter's discussion and even bonus episodes with Michael and 50 more great talks with experts on Bob Dylan, become an FM Plus or premium subscriber. Did you enjoy this show? Then please rate this podcast and leave a review. It really helps. Also, sign up for seven days, our free weekly newsletter that puts all the top Bob Dylan news and links into your inbox every Sunday. Use the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening.